a song that lights up the stars. One breath that gives life, one sovereign in power who speaks with thunder and fire. One Lord, one there is no other that can compare to you. You are the one alone in greatness, the one who never changes. Jesus, you are the one who rose in power, the one Yahweh is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your hearts. Amen. Welcome. Uh, if you're our guest, we're glad that you are here. Uh, my name's Tim. I'm the associate pastor here at the Bible Church. Uh, if you need anything at all as our visitors, uh, please see one of our ushers in the back. They would be thrilled and happy to assist you uh, with any questions that you might have. A few announcements for you this morning. Uh, first, a big thank you to everyone that made it out to the work day yesterday uh, and all that you did um, around uh, the building, around the campus. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot uh, coming up. There's a lot happening right now. Uh, in particular, the Hallelujah Party is happening tomorrow evening here um, at 
the church. Uh, so with that in mind, one, thank you to all of you that are serving and that have signed up to serve. Uh, but two, we need and we ask for your help. After the service, uh, they're asking for eight round tables from this closet over here uh, to be taken out into the uh, lobby area uh, and set up with uh, six chairs around them each. Uh, they're going to use the cafe chairs, those black cafe chairs, not these blue chairs. Uh, so if as you guys are picking up the chairs, you'd be willing to help with that, that would be greatly appreciated. It's eight tables with six chairs around them. Um, a couple other events coming up. This Wednesday night, uh, how many years ago was it, Scott? Three years, four years, three years ago? Uh, the Million Dollar Man came. Do you guys know who the Million Dollar Man is? I don't, I, a big wrestler, I guess. I don't know, former wrestler. Anyways, he's coming back. This Wednesday evening, he's coming back. Uh, and the event is open from everybody from grade six through adults, okay? So you can come, bring your friends. Uh, he'll be here this Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m.? 6.45 p.m. Um, so come and hear uh, The Million Dollar Man. It should be a pretty cool event. Uh, one other uh, event that is coming up will be uh, next Sunday, November the 6th. There will be a mother-daughter watercolor night. Um, it's going to be I think co-led by Christine and my wife are going to be kind of, they're working on that together. Uh, there's a Facebook event, so if you haven't seen that, hopefully that'll, you'll catch that somehow. Look on our church Facebook page. Uh, but please sign up because they need to know uh, if you're going to come, how many people, so they can get the right supplies, and I think they're going to have some refreshments and things like that. Uh, so that's this coming Sunday evening. I'm not sure on the time, uh, but it will say so on the sign-up sheet out there on the information desk. Uh, would you pray with me this morning as we uh, continue the service? Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be in your house together. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity and the privilege it is to come and to worship you. We ask now uh, that you would just help us to uh, set aside everything that's going on in our lives, uh, all, everything that's running through our minds, and just focus on you this morning. Uh, as we sing and as we uh, hear from your word, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts and challenge us. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Scripture calls us to ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. It's actually a phrase that pops up a couple of times in the Psalms. It's a reminder that we worship God because he deserves it. And he's deserving of so much glory, so much more glory than we could ever give. So let's sing his praise together right now. Sing with me, ascribe to the Lord. Ascribe unto the Lord the glory to his name. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor and the praise, for he is holy and he is worthy of. i 
Psalm 148, we find these words. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in the heavens. Praise him from the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him. Forgive me, I completely lost the words, Mom. Sun and moon. Thank you. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He spoke a decree. They were established. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail snow and mist, storm and hail fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying things, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and heavens. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. Let's answer that call and praise the Lord together. Would you stand? Holy, holy, holy Lord God
with the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful men. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to ushers come forward and you take a seat, would you bow with me in prayer? Father, you are holy and you are worthy. We come to you this morning in recognition that uh, there's not enough praise we can give, there's not enough of an offering we can give that would ever uh, measure up to your holiness and your worthiness, and we come to you so grateful that you don't expect us to. Uh, that in the person of Jesus Christ, you made it possible for us to come into this place and have a relationship with you and pour out our hearts in worship, even though we're unworthy, because when you look on us, you see his righteousness. And so these praises, Lord, this act of worship and giving we offer to you as an act of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, our God and our Savior. Amen. We've been singing of the greatness of God. And uh, that greatness is demonstrated so clearly in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we want to share with you a new song this morning that's a reflection on that, that story. How worthy our God is of praise as we reflect on that story. We're going to sing, meditate on these words, and at the end I'll invite you to join us. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet My Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all of Break of dawn. 
of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face Would you stand one more time, sing the praise of the God who saves. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Joseph. Um, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, many of us in this room this morning, many of you, um, I think, would very, very, um, very much be willing to say um, that you're anxious, that you're worried that there are things in your life that make you nervous. Um, whether, whether it's uh, things that are going on in your home with your family, whether it's things that are going on in, in our world around us, many of you, I think, uh, would express a sense of sadness over where we have come over the years. Um, in our nation, a lot of you would say, you would look and talk about how we used to be a Christian nation. I hear that all the time. We used to be a Christian nation, but we're not anymore. Or we look at the church and we say, <clears throat> the church used to be something that was revered. It was, used to be something that people uh, valued. It used to be something that, like, the school, like, never took away from church, and sports never took away from church. But look at us now. Like, where have we come? And, and we look, and, and we see that there are things all around um, in the world that can be discouraging, that can be disheartening. You know, maybe it's at home, maybe it's your family, maybe uh, somebody's sick, 
Maybe somebody is suffering or fighting a disease or battling cancer. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you're just scared to death about the election next week. Maybe, you know, whatever it might be. But we all, we have this sense, and I can feel it, and I can see it in our culture around us, this sense of fear, this sense of what in the world have we gotten ourselves into? Like, what in the world is going on? And it can be a hard thing for us. It can be a hard thing for us. Circumstances don't always go our way. You know, the issues of life don't always go how we want them to go. Life is tough. The question that I want to ask you this morning, the question that I want to ask myself this morning is simply this. How do we respond when life gets tough? When circumstances don't go our way, how do we respond? How do we deal with it? How do we deal with an election coming up and nobody knows who on earth they're supposed to vote for? How do we deal with illness in our family? How do we deal with our marriage that seems to be falling apart? What do we do? How do we react? How do we respond when circumstances get tough. In an attempt to answer this question, what I want to do is I want to take you guys on a little journey, uh, and I want to go to Psalm chapter 78. If you have your Bible, that's where we're going to look, is Psalm chapter 78. Um, And I want us to kind of look, and I want us to ask ourselves this question. Like, as you're sitting there listening to me as you're turning in your Bible or pulling it up on your phone, I I want you to ask yourself this question. When circumstances in your life get tough, how do you respond? What's your reaction? How do you handle it? Because we all face situations like this, and and we all battle issues in our lives when things don't go how we want them to go. We can't control a lot of things that happen. But we can, to some extent, control how we respond. Psalm chapter 78 uh, is a long psalm. We're not going to read it all. It's 72 verses. Um, You can thank me now uh, that we're not going to read it all. Uh, But we are going to read some of it, and we are going to kind of scan the whole thing. Uh, It's a historical psalm. There's a lot of history in it, dealing with the people of Israel. Uh, And we come and we read this psalm, uh, and we're going to read a few verses, and I'm going to kind of just kind of give you a broad scope of what is going on here. Uh, What's fascinating to me, I I think the psalms are fascinating in the fact that that like they were written and they were meant to be sung so it's crazy to me like I would love for Joseph or somebody in here that's musically talented to come and like take this psalm and like turn it into a song you know like it it might be a really long song but it's fascinating to me like they would write these songs and like they would sing this stuff and here this psalm is and, and it's their history It's a history of what they had been through. Uh, And we're going to see it's a very small portion of their history, but it's a very, very crucial time in their history. So we're going to go, and we're going to read the first few verses of Psalm chapter 78, uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit, and we're going to explore some ideas. But all the while, while we go through all of this, I want you to ask yourself this question. How do I respond when life stinks? How do I respond when my circumstances are tough and things are not going my way? Let's go to Psalm chapter 78. It begins, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but we will tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Uh, Just let's pause there and address a few things. The first interesting thing to me is, I don't know if you noticed it, but in verse 2, he talks about how he's going to open his mouth in a parable. 
okay, in a parable. Uh, typically, we hear of parables and we think New Testament, right? We think earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus is telling these stories that are kind of cute and funny and cool, uh, and they mean something important. Uh, what we find here is simply when he says that he's going uh, to use a parable, basically what he's saying is like, I'm going to recount like stories of history and use them as illustrations to get a point across. That's what a parable does, ultimately. Like, if you look in the New Testament and you look at the parables, basically what's happening is Jesus is making a point, and he's saying something, and he gives a principle, and then he tells a story to illustrate it. The same thing is happening here. The psalmist, as he writes, is basically making a point, or a couple points, or a number of points, and he's using historical, true historical stories to illustrate them. So, what are the points that he's making? Like, what's the purpose of this psalm? What is he talking about? Why, why this? What's going on here? Um, here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you two things, generally. Uh, the first thing I'm going to kind of breeze through as quickly as possible, and the second thing I'm going to hit home on, hopefully. Uh, the first thing is this. This psalm, Psalm chapter 78, is typically used uh, in sermons and in teaching to talk about how you as parents and how we as a church should seek to raise up our kids in Christ, in the Lord, which is a good thing. Your Bible, my Bible, for example, even, like the the very beginning of it, it says, tell the coming generation. Like, that's the title. Tell the coming generation. So we come and we look at this psalm, and I think there's some truth to it, and I think there's some importance in the fact that we need to train up our kids, that we need to uh, teach our kids about what God is doing and about what God has done. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time there, but I want to show you something. Uh, here is a, um, it's a chart um, from pewresearch.org or pewresearch.com, one of the two, Pew, Pew Research Center. Anyways, um, here's what it says. Um, I don't know if you can read it or not, but more or less what it is, is it's a chart showing uh, the generations from basically 1928, what it calls the silent generation, all the way up into what they call younger millennials, so those born in the early 90s. Uh, and it's kind of charts, like percentage of people in the U.S., adults, um, who have values relating to scripture um, or relating to religion, I guess is the better way to put it. Um, so you can see that there's those orange lines there. I kind of tried to highlight a couple things. Um, the first thing, um, and let me make it clear, like believing in God is not the same as believing in Jesus. I recognize that. Um, but it's really interesting to look at this and to think that from 1928, the silent generation, if you look, somebody, oh, does this work? Look at that. Wow. Um, so you can see, and uh, the silent generation, the percentage of adults that were born between 1928 and 1945, 92% of them said that they believe in God. Okay, 92% said they believe in God. 71 said with absolute certainty, okay? If you go, you can see a gradual decline, right? All the way up until you get to younger millennials, those born between 90 and 96. And it says that younger millennials, 80%, that's a 12% drop there. Uh, or if you look below, those that believe with absolute certainty, 50% of younger millennials believe with absolute certainty that there is a God. That's a pretty big drop-off, right? That's a pretty big decline. Uh, the other thing that was just interesting is simply the, the importance of religion to these people, right? Um, so if you look at the very, very bottom uh, statistic, uh, it talks about how many of these people, what percentage of these people say religion is important in their lives. The silent generation, the oldest generation, 60, is that 67, 87, 67? 67 um, percent of them said religion is very important in their lives compared to 38 percent of younger millennials. There are all kinds of statistics like these out there. There are all kinds of studies that show more or less that the church is on the decline, right? That religion is on the decline. Uh, Tom Rayner, a guy that works with Lifeway, some of you are familiar with Lifeway, a big Christian publishing uh, curriculum organization. Uh, he wrote a book uh, back in the mid-90s. Uh, I think it was called the Bridger, uh, the Bridger Generation, something like that. More or less, he did a study similar to this. And the study basically showed um, that it went from, like, if you started at, like, the baby boomers or before the baby boomers, like, some 80-something percent of people of, would say that they believed in Jesus uh, compared to, like, less than 10%. Uh, of younger people that said they believed in Jesus. So it's just interesting to see, like, studies come out, and we see that, like, there's this problem, there's this apparent decline in the church. 
There's this apparent decline in the importance of religion for uh, our families, for kids, for, for those that are growing up. And when we see statistics like this, I can't help but ask myself, why is that the case? Right? Why would that be the case? You could throw out any number of reasons, right? Media, there's too much TV, the internet is killing it all, politicians, um, Democrats, whatever, like you name it. Like, you know, there's all these things that you hear, right? Like, I've heard it all. Um, So, like, you name it. Like, we have all these excuses for why the church seems to be on a decline. Now, first, let me just go ahead and throw this out there. Um, I'm not convinced that the church is actually on a decline, What I kind of think might be happening is that the people that are just kind of wishy-washy maybe aren't coming anymore, right? Like, is that possible? It might be possible. So maybe we're getting to a point where, like, the people that are actually involved in church actually, like, are involved and actually have that relationship with Christ. I don't know. But nevertheless, like, we see numbers like these, and I go back, and I can't help but think, like, a lot of people are fearful about this kind of thing. A lot of people, like, see this and we're like, oh my goodness, what is going on? If there is a decline, though, if there really is a decline, who's to blame? I can't help but think. Like, it all starts, right? Like, it all starts, one, with the church, and two, at home, or vice versa, however you want to put it. Like, home and the church connect to develop the coming generations, right? Like, we have a duty as a body of Christ to work as much as possible alongside families and parents to to raise up the next generation. So, if there is, in fact, a decline in religion, like, nobody is to blame but ourselves, Why do I say that? How do I get that from Psalm chapter 78? Here's what I see. I see the psalmist writing. I I see the psalmist writing, and and he's challenging the people to remind their children of the commands, to remind their children not only of the commands, but of the glorious deeds that that God has done. If you look like verse 5, for example, it says, He established a testimony in Jacob. And he appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and that they would arise and tell them to their children, so that they could set their hope in God. You see, the people of Israel we're going to find as we move forward in this psalm uh, had a problem, okay? We're going to find that they had a problem, uh, and the problem is going to become that they failed to do that. That's why he's challenging them to do it, okay? So let's look. Um, We're going to move on. I think there is a broader principle in this psalm. I think, yeah, it talks about how we need to uh, teach the next generation, how we need to train the next generation, how we need to tell them about God, how we need to remind them about who God is and what God has done. But I think the issue is bigger than the next generation, I think the issue is bigger than those coming behind us because I think what we find with the people of Israel is that the reason that the psalmist has to write this to them to tell them not to, to to tell them to teach the coming generations is that they themselves were already forgetting. We're already failing to remember themselves. Um, So let's do this. Uh, I just read a little bit of this passage that's right there uh, in Psalm chapter 78. But I want to give you, this this is the key thing that I find in Psalm chapter 78 that I think is important for us to remember and is important for us to take home. And it is simply this. I think that the psalmist writes this so that the people would not forget God, right? This is God's chosen people, right? Like, these are God's chosen people. The nation of Israel were God's chosen people. And here the psalmist is writing so that the people that were God's chosen people wouldn't forget him. How do I know that? Why do I say that? I'm going to show you in just a second. But this whole psalm, this whole psalm revolves around two things. It revolves around the incredible works that God has done for the nation of Israel, the incredible miracles that he has performed, and then the response of the people back to God. 
do you guys ever in your life like have things that you remember and like you're like I will never forget that in my life like there I think we do uh, I have a terrible memory my wife would tell you she'd be like man Tim doesn't remember a thing like I, I, I don't know if I agree all the time but like there are things in my life that I promise you like I, I don't think I will ever forget um some good things, some bad things. And I think you guys probably have the same. You probably think of some right now. Things in your life that you will never forget. Um, <clears throat> some of them are probably, like, pretty uh, um, unimportant to you. But, like, for example, I remember uh, the first goal I ever scored in a hockey game. Like, and I remember exactly how I went. We were the gray team. I was in, like, third grade. Uh, we were in Georgia. And I, I can remember the rink we were at. I can remember where it was. And I can remember this guy. I was, like, cherry-picking on the blue line, if you know what that means. And, like, so I'm standing way up there, and this guy gives me a pass, and I get a breakaway, and I go, and I'm this little guy. And, like, I deke this way, and the goalie moves, and I shoot it, and I score. And, like, I think, like, I, I remember that. That was, like, I don't know, 18 years ago, something like that. It's a long time ago. I remember it. On the flip side, like, I played goalie most of my life, and I remember some really bad goals that I let in. Like, I remember this, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't even matter. Um, but I remember, like, this really bad goal. Like, and it's just like, there's things in my mind that I don't forget. Um, and there's times in my life, and there's things in my life where I've seen uh, what I believe the hand of God act in my life that I don't think I'll ever forget. For example, uh, when I was my junior and my senior year of high school, I took uh, trips to Russia, a mission trip to Russia each year uh, with my church. Uh, and I think it was my senior year. I think it was the second time I went. I had come back home. We were gone for about 10 days. I had come back home. Uh, my dad had picked me up at the airport uh, in Atlanta. And he picked me up at the airport. And I think we drove to his work uh, where I ended up getting my car and he stayed at work. Uh, and I was driving home and I was going north on I-75. I don't know if anybody's driven on I-75 in Atlanta before, but it's like five, six, seven lanes, like pretty big interstate. And I'm driving up I-75. It's probably about a half an hour trip back to my house. Uh, and as I'm driving up the interstate, I'm driving. It's my, I've got a 94 green Explorer. I love that thing. Um, and, and I was driving up the interstate. And as I'm driving, this car like starts to cut me off, right? And it wasn't like a quick cut off. Like it was like he starts veering over um, and he clearly was not looking. And honestly, like he would have hit me. So I slam on the brakes, right? Like in the middle of the interstate and there's cars like flying all around me. Literally, I slam on the brakes and I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was scared out of my mind. I thought I was gonna die because I slam on the brakes and like my wheel starts to turn. So like it turns this way and then I try and correct it back this way and two or three times, like I'm back this way, back this way, back this way. And like the reason that I'm still here today and I didn't go flipping or a car that was zooming by me didn't hit me is not because I was a really good driver, like, I am absolutely convinced that God kept me safe in that moment. And I don't think I will ever forget that moment. And I'm not trying to be, like, all super spiritual, supernatural, but it was crazy, and it scared me to death. But I'm convinced that it's only by God's grace that I'm alive today from that moment. And I can't help but think that as we see and we look into this psalm and we look at the people of Israel, the people of Israel were full of these unforgettable moments. Like their history is full of moments that they should never forget. Yet the psalmist is writing, challenging them not to forget and to remind themselves. What do I mean by that? Uh, I'm gonna, I told you I'm not gonna read the whole psalm. Uh, these are, what is it, seven things, six things uh, that the psalmist talks about. Six stories that the psalmist talks about in Psalm chapter 78 about things that God has done for the people of Israel. Pretty incredible things, right? Like, we know the story about uh, the parting of the Red Sea so that they could escape, that they could leave Egypt. Um, and then just all these incredible things. God provides manna from heaven. He, he, he provides water from rocks. Uh, the fact that, like, when God was getting ready to rescue the people out of slavery in Egypt, that he sent plagues against their enemies, against those that were enslaving them. Some pretty unforgettable things. I think my top one would have to be the parting of the Red Sea. Like, if I were there, like, I don't know how you ever forget something like that. <laughs> Yet the psalmist here, he is writing to them. And he's telling them not to forget. And he's telling them, tell your children and have them tell their children so that we, they will not forget what the Lord has done. His great and his wondrous and his mighty works and his mighty deeds. 
The people forgot. Uh, If you look at verse 11, you skip down a little bit. Verse 11, it says, they forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. Verse 42 is another one. It, It says, they did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them. The question is, why not? The question is, why not? How is it possible that they would forget these things? Why did they not remember? First of all, I'm not convinced that they actually like literally forgot them. Here's what I think is kind of going on, okay? Um, I don't know, those of you who are married, um, I don't know if you ever get to a place in your marriage uh, where your spouse is driving you nuts and it seems like you can't remember the last time they did anything nice or fair or good to you. Like, you know, there are times, like, in marriage where it happens, like, you're just in a mood and you get frustrated for whatever reason, and, like, it's like your spouse can't do anything right, and, like, circumstances aren't going well, and they're grumpy, and they're snapping at you, and it's just like, you get to this point where it's like, have you ever done anything nice to me at all? Like, you know, it it happens, right? And if it doesn't happen, like, we need some tips here. Like, come on. Um, Because it happens, It it happens. And I think that's kind of what's going on here. I think the people of Israel got to a place in their lives where circumstances were not going how they wanted them to go. And they focused so much on their circumstances that in the moment, they forgot what God had done. What were their circumstances? What was going on? Brief history lesson Israel was enslaved in Egypt, right? They were in bondage in Egypt. God rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, After they left, after they got out of slavery in Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, um, God had promised the people that they were going to go to the promised land. But prior to that, they spent some 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Okay? They spent some 40 years wandering in the wilderness. We see all this in Exodus uh, Anywhere between like chapters 10 and 20 Uh, You can find a lot of this stuff But here's what I want you to see In Exodus chapter 16 You don't have to turn there You can look on the screen But I want you to see what it says In the first few verses of Exodus chapter 16 And I want us to think about it for just a minute It says that they Speaking of the people of Israel They set out to Or they set out from Elim And all of the congregation of the people of Israel Came to the wilderness of Sin Which is between Elim and Sinai It says, on the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, and listen to what it says, the whole congregation of people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out of this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. The people of Israel had recently been rescued out of slavery in Egypt. And here they are in the wilderness. First of all, I I don't know how many of you like to camp. Um, I've been camping uh, a number of times. I've taken students on camping trips. I've taken, you know, I've been on camping trips when I was a student. you can't get through a weekend, first of all, without people complaining about something when you go camping. Like, it's just not possible. Um, If it's possible, like, you're living in luxury and you're not really camping. Um, (laughs) These people made it, by my estimation, 45 days, okay, from what we see. Uh, We see that it says um, it was the 15th day of the second month. So we're gonna call it 45 days, okay? 45 days, and then we get a record that they start to complain. Okay, this is 45 days of 40 years, first of all. Um, But they start to complain. And the problem is this. These people got rescued, and they're here in this wilderness, and they're wandering in the wilderness, and they're thinking back to, oh my goodness, we were slaves in Egypt, and we had better food to eat than we have here. Their circumstances were not ideal. They get to a place in their lives where things are not going how they thought they should, how they thought they wanted them to, to the point where they assumed or where they got to the place where they thought it would be better for them to still be enslaved because they could eat what they want. And they could sit and they could eat and get full. So they start to grumble. They start to grumble against the Lord. Life in the wilderness was not as luxurious as life in Egypt, apparently. 
they start to grumble and they start to doubt God and they start to forget. If you look, and I'm, I, I don't have this all on the screen, uh, but we find three times in Psalm chapter 78, uh, there's like three sections basically um, in which there's a series of stories and events told by the psalmist and then we see the reaction of the people. For example, uh, if you look, we already read verse 11. It says, they forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. Uh, and then it goes on. If you read, we'll read a little bit more. It says uh, in verse 12, in the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders, okay, in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. Uh, and, and then it says that he divided the sea. He's talking about part in the Red Sea. He divided the sea and he let them pass through it. He made the waters stand like a heap and these people walked through the sea. Um, and then it says in the daytime he led them with a cloud and at night with a fiery light. It says he split rocks in the wilderness and he gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. And then it says he made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like a river. And then look at verse 17. So we just went through four or five verses. Look at all that God did. He split the Red Sea. He parted the Red Sea. He made waters come from rocks. He did all these things. And then in verse 17, look at what it says. Yet they still sinned more against him. Rebelling against the Most High in the desert, they tested God in their heart by demanding the food that they craved. They didn't like their circumstances. They wanted to eat like they ate in Egypt. And they got to a place where they didn't have what they thought they should have had. They didn't have what they wanted, so they start to grumble. And they forgot all that God had done. And they forgot all that God had brought them from and what he was bringing them to. We see a series of events like this happen similarly. Verse 32 is another uh, verse where it says, in spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. <clears throat> I think my favorite is the, the end, the last one. Verse 56, we see it one more time. Uh, I'm not gonna read it all. Uh, but 45 through 55 is basically a recounting of all the plagues of Egypt. So the psalmist goes through and he's like, he brought these plagues and these plagues and all these different things, all these things to rescue the people eventually from Egypt. And then in verse 56, it says, yet they tested and they rebelled against the most high God and they did not keep his testimonies. So we see a people of Israel who had so many unforgettable moments, who God had done so much for in their lives and in their journey. He brought them out of slavery and he was leading them into a land that the Bible says was flowing with milk and honey. He was leading them to the promised land and he had brought them out of slavery. But they were in a time where they felt like it was trying. They were in the wilderness wandering. They didn't have the food that they once had. Their circumstances were far from ideal. And they began to forget who God was, what God had done. They began to forget. They focused so much on the fact they didn't have the food that they wanted to eat. And they started to doubt. I can't help but go back to this last question, or the beginning question. What about us? How do I respond when my circumstances are far from ideal? How do you respond when your circumstances are far from ideal? We got news um, this past week about somebody in our family uh, that's having some health issues. Uh, it's kind of frightening, like a little bit frightening. Um, and the question that I have to ask myself is how do I respond in a situation where somebody that I love has some sort of an illness or some sort of a disease and I have no control over it? How do I respond? How do you respond when you and your wife haven't gotten along in a year, two years, when all you do is fight, how do you respond when you've got a kid who is a hellion and won't listen to you? What do you do when you lose somebody that you love? It's very, very easy for us to get to a place in our life where we become like the people of Israel and we forget all that God has done for us and all that he continues to do. Life is tough. 
circumstances are tough. We're not immune from problems. We're not immune from struggles and trials. We can't control a lot of what happens in our lives, but we surely can control how we respond. Now, let me make it clear. I think it's natural for us, um, and not that it's a good thing, but I think it's kind of natural for us to just start to doubt a little bit, right? I think it's a little bit natural simply because we're sinful beings, right? Like we, in and of ourselves, like it is in our nature to reject God. So it's natural for us to struggle and to begin to doubt and to begin to ask God questions like, God, where are you? God, why are you doing this? God, do you even care? You lose your job. You're struggling at your job. You get your pay cut, whatever it might be. How do we respond? Do we respond by running to God in prayer and trusting and remembering, God, you have done so much for me in the past? Or do we turn and we say, God, it'd be better for us to still be slaves? God, it'd be better for us if we didn't even have to think about you. If we could just be back in Egypt and work for them and they would feed us all that we want. How do we respond? How do you respond? I I would challenge you, and I would challenge myself this morning, let us never forget all that God has done in our lives. Be it God's provision, be it God's care, be it the fact that he's kept you safe. Like I said, I will never forget that moment, I don't think. I don't think I'll ever forget that moment driving on the highway when I literally thought I was gonna die. God kept me safe for whatever reason. But ultimately, like, when we think about all that God has done for us, you can't help but turn to the cross and look at the cross and say, God, you died for me. So surely, surely when my kids are brats and my kids don't listen to me, and surely when work stinks, and surely when my wife and I can't seem to figure it out, and surely when my mom or my dad or my cousin or whoever, my best friend is like sick and dying of cancer. Surely, yeah, it's a hard time, but surely I can remember that God cared enough to come and to die to give us hope and give us life. Surely I can remember the fact that God himself came as a man and lived and he suffered and he died. Surely I can remember and have hope Even when my circumstances are tough, God is still God. God is still on his throne. And God still cares. The Bible never promises, you know, this happy-go-lucky life with no problems to those who uh, decide to follow Jesus. In fact, it's quite the opposite a lot of times. Um, I would challenge you, whatever you're going through, wherever you are in life, whatever those circumstances are that you're thinking about that just can't seem to go away and you don't understand why it's happening, don't forget. Don't forget all that God has done. Don't forget all that God is doing. And even more so, don't forget the hope that we have of eternity with him. God has done so much. God is doing so much. And there's so much more to come. Let us never forget that. Let's pray, and then we're going to sing one closing song. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for who you are, for the works that you have done, the examples that we find in Scripture uh, of the way that you care for your people, of the way that you provide for your people and even the examples in our own lives of things that you have done where we have seen your hand at work in our families, in our homes, at work, wherever we might be. I do pray for those in this room that are going through tough times, that are struggling with uh, whatever it might be, whether it's marriage, whether it's kids, whether it's work, whether it's health issues, whether it's the loss of a loved one. Lord, I pray that you would help them, that you would help us collectively to never forget, to constantly remember that you are still God, even in the midst of our trials, that you are still God, even in the midst 
of our unfortunate circumstances. And Lord, we ask that you would please help us rather than directing our attention and focusing on the bad things and the unfortunate circumstances in our lives. Help us to fix our eyes on you and never let them go. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm, uh, I'm calling an audible here. <laughs> the, uh, the team wasn't ready for this, so give them grace. But as Tim spoke, I just can't help but think it was easy for the children of Israel to remember they'd been rescued out of, or to forget they'd been rescued out of slavery. It's easy for us to forget that same thing. So to close today, I just want to sing a simple chorus. Um, the words, the words are, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That's what we need to remember tonight. Sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. child of God. Let's not forget it. I'm no longer. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You're dismissed. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me.